Hello and welcome back to the third in a series on astrophotography. Now in the first installment, we looked at the history of astrophotography, and in the second installment, we looked at why we should do this, and we looked at an old telescope to see how it performed against a newer one. In this installment, we're going to be looking at nightscapes. It's the first kind of astrophotography. Now I find that the word astrophotography is often misunderstood. Astrophotography is actually a broad term encompassing at least three different disciplines. Number one, nightscapes. Number two, webcam lunar planetary. And number three, guided deep sky. The three are completely different from one another and require completely different equipment and processes. So we're gonna go through each of these separately. Okay, so the first kind of astrophotography is nightscapes. And a nightscape is any kind of activity which involves you taking a camera of some kind, putting it on a tripod, opening the shutter, and just seeing what happens. Now, it's nothing stopping anybody here from doing this. You could take any kind of camera here. We've got a lot of toys here. We'll show you these. But take any kind of camera here. This is a, looks like it's a Canon 6D. And we could just put it on a tripod like this. And, you know, you turn it on here and you can just start snapping away and you watch what happens. Now, if you're new at this and you actually tried this, you probably found out it usually doesn't work very well, does it? <laughs> okay, so what went wrong? Lots of things. So when you're gonna do this, the kind of camera that you need is something that, we ha that can be fully manually controlled. That is, it, you can control the three things that are common to any manual camera, the ISO, that's the speed of the sensor, the aperture, which is how wide the thing opens, and number three, the shutter speed. You do need control over all three of those things. In addition, you do want a lens that has a manual focus on it. You don't want to be depending on the camera's autofocus system. It will fail you. <laughs> and the other thing you're going to need is this button which says live preview on it so that you can actually preview what's going through the lens. Yes, you are going to be focusing through live preview. Most newer cameras have this, but I've got a few older ones here that don't, and it's going to be very, very difficult for you to focus if you don't have live preview. So you do need that. Okay, so what went wrong? Well, lots of things. Number one, simple stuff that you never thought of before, like framing an object. So let's say you wanted to take a picture of Cassiopeia, that's the M or the W up in the sky. It's kind of hard to see it through the live preview and you could put the thing off to the side, which is what's happened here. The second thing you can do is exposure, which is wrong. Exposure too low and your screen turns black exposure too high, and you'll just blow out the sensor and there's no information to recover. ISO is the same way. A lot of people like to crank up the ISO so that the sensitivity is at its highest, but if you do that, then you could blow out the image as well. So the question becomes, what is the correct setting for those three items? The aperture, the exposure, and the ISO. And the answer is, it depends on where you are. <laughs> Sorry, I can't give you an answer to this one. It changes all the time, depending on where you happen to be. So there's gonna be a lot of experimentation that happens here between you shifting back and forth between aperture, exposure, and ISO to determine what works in your particular situation. And again, this is very fickle. For example, if you were to take uh, in, you know, your rig that you know those values and then you move them to a dark sky, let's say you drove out to a dark sky, you're gonna have to experiment all over again to find the correct settings. Now for me around here, I find most of the time ISO 1600 works pretty well. Whatever the maximum aperture opening is on the lens, I will stop it down by one or two stops and the exposure time we're gonna to get to in just a second. Okay, so what is the correct exposure time? Now, we find a lot of times that when people don't get enough information on the sensor, one of the first things they do is they'll stick a telephoto lens on there to get really close to the object, or they'll start increasing the exposure time to let more light come into the camera. But if you've ever tried that, you know that that doesn't work very well either. And the reason is because the earth rotates. <laughs> yes, you have to try to compensate for this. So the question becomes, 
what is the maximum amount of time that you can expose for without streaking the stars into lines instead of points? And we have this thing called the rule of 500. And the rule of 500 states that the focal length of the lens times the amount of time in seconds should be less than or equal to 500. Now I've created this table for you here so you don't have to do this yourself, but on a full frame sensor, these are some common lenses that you might use, and those are the maximum lengths of time suggested that you should expose for without streaking the stars into lines instead of points. What does the rule of 500 really tell you? What it really tells you is you don't have a lot of time. I mean, look at the 50 millimeter lens. Most people have one of those things. You don't have a lot of time, but it gets even worse. Those times are only accurate for a full frame sensor like this Canon 6D. If you have a camera with an APS-C sensor, this is a SL1, you've actually got to divide that by 1.6. If you have a Sony or a Nikon, you divide by 1.5. So the rule of 500 actually gets worse the smaller the sensor gets. If you have a micro four third sensor, that's a two to one crop ratio, everything gets worse by half. Again, what the rule of 500 is telling you is that you don't have a lot of time. Now, what can you do about all this? Well, we can have a device that tracks the stars, turning the camera in a direction equal and opposite to the rotation of the Earth. And we can do this. There's some low-tech ways to do this. This is called a barn door tracker. And there are plans for these things online. I've got this one here. This one I've got a ball head on. When I teach classes, I'll loan these out to students and I'll challenge them to find the best, get the best image possible with a barn door tracker. But you know, for this particular type, the only two critical dimensions are the distance between the screw and the hinge here. And I think this has to be a quarter inch by 20. But if you do this right, you can turn this wheel one revolution per minute. So if you have an old style analog watch, you just turn this thing to match this and you can Track the stars, thus freeing you from the rule of 500. Nice, isn't it? Some people have gotten some pretty nice images with these. Now, these days, I don't see people using those a lot. What you can do is buy one of these. And there are several different models of this one is a sky watcher that I carry with me. And this screws, I'm not gonna do it, but this screws on top of here. And this is an electronic version, which does it for you automatically. It's battery operated. You can walk away and it'll do the job by itself. This thing's been with me all over the world. I've taken it to Greece and to Chile and to England. It's getting kind of beat up. I actually need to get another one. This switch is kind of broken here. So, but you can do this if you want. These cost anywhere from three to $500 or so and up depending on which options you want to get. Okay, so let's say you get all of that dialed in. The aperture, the ISO, and the exposure. Those three things I'm pretty confident you're gonna get dialed in with some experience and with some time. Focus is kind of the final frontier. Nobody really knows how to focus things. You kind of know, and they've come up with devices and methods for focusing, but it doesn't really entirely work, and you'll figure that out. I take thousands of frames yearly. I still miss focus, you know, a small minority of the time. Other than focus, the thing that's going to get you is the tracking of the stars. That thing works, but it can screw up from time to time. If your polar alignment is not good, if your technique is not good, that will screw you up also. But I think you'll kind of, kind of figure that out to the point where you'll get usable images. Now let's talk about a couple of advanced things. I don't want to get too much into this because this is supposed to be a basic video. But you're going to find you get those things dialed in, you get images that look okay, and then what happens is you're going to hit a ceiling. That is, you're going to get better for a while, and then you realize, I'm not getting any bit better. <laughs> so a couple of advanced techniques here. Number one is this idea of stacking. People have been stacking even analog photographic film for a long time, and the principle behind stacking is pretty simple. The signal that you want tends to be constant. But noise, which is what you're trying to get rid of, tends to be random. So the more frames you can stack together, the signal tends to get better and the noise tends to cancel itself out. You'll see people stacking a lot of images. I know people who almost go crazy with this kind of thing. But the common rule of thumb is the 
noise goes down as the inverse square root of the number of frames that you take. So in other words, if you stack 25 frames, the noise is going to be one-fifth of what it was before. Now there's a free utility you can get called Deep Sky Stacker. There's an expensive one and hard to use one called Pix Insight, which is better, but let's stick with the freeware for now until you get a handle on things. I'm not going to go through a tutorial on Deep Sky Stacker for a couple of reasons. Number one, we're going to be here for a while and it's kind of boring to watch. And number two, there are already some very good tutorials online about how to use that piece of software. But just as a real quick example here, here is a picture of the Andromeda Galaxy that I took, and there were three frames stacked together, and that's not too bad, but if I stack 22 frames together, look what happens to the signal-to-noise ratio. It gets a lot better. So you can stack all sorts of light frames, that's the images that you take. You can also stack dark frames. That's right, one of the things that we obsess over is we'll put a cap on the lens in the dark and we'll take a picture of nothing. <laughs> Taking a picture of nothing is actually quite useful because all of those hot pixels and you know pixels that are turned on the wrong way and all these sort of anomalies that are in your sensor, throw that into the hopper and deep sky stacker, it will mathematically subtract all of that and your image will get even better. As an example, here's a stacked frame of Cygnus and Lyra together. And here is the same image stacked with darks. You can see how much better that gets. Okay, now we're getting pretty advanced here, but I do want to mention this idea of the modified camera. A normal camera like this has something called an IR cut filter in it. So all around us, there's IR light. It's red, infrared, and we can't see it, but the camera can. So as a result, camera manufacturers put an IR filter cut sensor in there to take that out. What's the problem with this? Well, the problem is much, if not most of the stuff you're trying to capture up there is in the infrared. So if you just use a stock camera, in some ways, the camera is actually working against you. So as you increase the exposure, what tends to happen is you tend to collect a lot more noise. So the way around this is to modify your camera. And I've got a couple of these. This is my EOS 5D. You've seen a lot of images taken through this thing. But here's what they do. You have to send your camera off to someone and they will go inside and remove that IR filter. What's the disadvantage of this? Well, the first thing is the cost. It will cost anywhere from several hundred dollars and I've seen people charge up to a thousand dollars to do this. Second thing is, it voids your camera's warranty. Yes, that's fun, isn't it? And the third thing is, it renders your camera useless for terrestrial photography. So in other words, here's a picture that I took with an unmodified camera, and you can see it next to it what happens when there's a picture taken with the modified camera. As you can see, it is quite red. Now, there are people who will tell you that you can use this customize function to rebalance the white balance to the point where it can be used terrestrially for normal photographs. I have never been able to make that work on any camera I've tried. Maybe you can do it. I don't know, but I'm telling you it's never worked for me. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples of some nightscapes that I've taken. And you can see some of these. I took this one of the Southern Cross from Chile. I took this one of M8, the Lagoon Nebula. That doesn't look too bad. That is 97 frames stacked with darks, and I would have taken more, except the camera's memory card ran out. Here's a single frame picture, no stacks at all. It's just a picture of the field where I was sitting when I took the Sagittarius image, and I was out from a remote village in Chile, and it was really cold out because it's the desert out there. And I actually fell asleep while taking this one. The following morning, I told the person at the hotel what had happened. And he said, Senor, uh, you don't want to be falling asleep in the field because it's the desert and we have snakes. And you know what snakes like to do at night? Yeah, they like to curl up to, next to something really warm. Now, while I was down there, I was in the company of a true master of this craft, Matt Dietrich. I will link his website below. And watching this guy work was just plain amazing. He could see things that I couldn't. I was standing right next to him when he took some of these images and I never actually saw the composition. I should have just copied what he did. 
But anyway, some of these images he's taking are just quite extraordinary. I don't know if you'll recognize this one, but that one was recognized by the National Park Service and wound up on a postage stamp. Okay, so in the past, nightscapes were probably viewed as a stepping stone, right? This is the first thing you did before you moved on to planetary or deep sky guided imaging. But these days, that's not so much true anymore. Nightscapes have become a destination for astrophotographers, and there are people who specialize in this, and they never move from anything else. Now, for me, I've always found nightscapes to be quite difficult. I don't know why. This activity and I just don't seem to see eye to eye. When I get a decent looking image, I think it's mainly for luck more than anything else. But you may be different. You may be really good at this. And again, none of this is easy. You need to be patient and take your time. What I find with all of these branches of astrophotography is that there is a learning curve anywhere from one to three years for you to achieve a degree of mastery in any of these. But be patient, you'll get there. I'm curious to see how you perform. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.